Yeah, because that's there, there is no real benefit to the average consumer because you don't really see the fees. And that's true. You have yeah. to keep track of more stuff, basically. Yeah, that's true. So for the average customer, probably there will be no big difference because they don't really see the fees. The fees are paid by the by Norwegian. Um, so, but they might have a bit of an impact on prices. So they the prices may go down a little bit because then Norwegian operations are a little bit cheaper, right? They don't have those extra fees. Um, then you might have uh, some um, benefits from usability. So cryptocurrencies are kind of easy to manage electronically because they have to be managed electronically. So it might have some usability benefits of managing a credit card, right? Um, marginally, because there are kind of a payment systems which you can plug into your phone and use it as if it is a kind of electronic currency anyway, right? Yeah. Um, there is also the fact that most people have credit cards and most people don't have uh, Bitcoins or anything like that. So, in the process, it yeah, become less usability because you are forcing them to use something they don't use. Yeah, the day. yeah. In in this case, you're right. Uh, in general, um, some cryptocurrency systems are used to kind of uh, help with the unbanked uh, populations, yeah. right? Uh, but in Norway, yeah, for sure, uh, all people have some form of bank account and, and so on. So, um, so what else? What that, what? So we, we discussed kind of the a potential uh, reasons. What what what's the one which is left, which is also very important? Privacy. Yeah. So what do you mean? You don't uh, uh, get tracked on the purchase of the plane ticket. With the, the cryptocurrency or without with it? With cryptocurrency, you don't get tracked. Yeah, so that's a big question mark. Yeah, because the name still has to go on the ticket. It depends, yes, exactly. It depends it on depends the cryptocurrency the system. On, on, uh, in Norway flights, they don't check your passport, they don't check anything. You can put whatever you want there, they won't check whether or not it's true. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think. I, I, I have just taken a plane to my mother and back. They never looked at my ID. Though. That might change though. Yeah. They, they looked at my ID when I was taking a flight to Poland. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, domestic flights, they don't check the ID, so that's privacy then. Yeah, but the, that, so the, the, this privacy thing is a factor, but it is a factor from the kind of the consumers and from uh, Norwegian as well. Right? So currently, people can do a lot of things with the financial system. And there is a lot of fraud as well, right? So people, you can buy a, a plane ticket not using your credit card. Or yeah, you there are prepaid cards. That's right, exactly. Or you can misuse it. Like you might be buying plane tickets from a stolen credit card, right? Uh, so the fraud is a big factor here, right? By having their own kind of a cryptocurrency system, they may reduce the fraudulent activities and so on, but they can also use it to track, right? So depending on the properties of the wallets and the properties of the cryptocurrency, it can enhance your privacy or it can diminish your privacy, right? Um, if you used cash for a prepaid credit card and bought tickets this way, you can kind of buy tickets anonymously. But maybe with the crypto system, you cannot do that. You have to be, um, you know, identified by name to be able to use it. Then you will lose privacy because every purchase you do is kind of in your name, right? Uh, so it's a, it, we don't know, right? For sure, the fraud is probably the factor, and the controlling uh, of that layer is, is probably a factor as well, right? Um, by moving the into cryptocurrency, they move the responsibility of handling fraud to the people selling cryptocurrency rather than... No, so not, not necessarily. It's as the, the point I get is that this is a kind of a private chain where Norwegian controls everything. So they exactly. control verification. Yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. Right. If, if they use the Bitcoin, then... No, uh, that is very unlikely. Yeah. Uh, so them using Bitcoin is very unlikely. Them doing some the, uh, private chain and doing, let's say, one token uh, equals one block, right? Uh, fixed rate uh, system, 
is probably the way they would go with because they can't really cope with the high, high volatility of the value of the coins for you know uh, purchases. So this is probably you know what they are thinking of uh, that there is some sort of a token system which you can store on your phone and sort of like a credit system and you can buy it, trade it, and buy you know, plane tickets with it, uh, gain rewards, whatever, right? Um, but with the privacy thing, I would rather lean that you will lose privacy, right? Um, so that day system would probably make use of the tracking data of how you spending your tokens, how you're using them, and so on. Um, it would be interesting to see how they would handle kind of uh, extracting and injecting assets. So like you kind of, if you have a thousand tokens at Norwegian, how do you kind of uh, extract your assets out of that? Or yeah. else it's kind of like, it's a monopoly on their currency basically, which you can't use anywhere else. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know how that would work. They will um, probably demand a fee on extracting asset. Yeah. And then they kind of earn money. On, on fees. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, it also is a little bit uh, interesting because if you were to buy a plane ticket and you need those tokens, you have to like preload your account, which means you have to freeze some of the assets, uh, which like makes no sense. Why would I freeze you know thousand krona before I want to fly anywhere? Um, yeah, I don't know. In, in in a sense, that's what the road tolls are doing as well. I have to pay uh, like, you know, 1000 krona up front to have a discount and then I'm, I'm using my tolls as I'm using them with a discount. If I don't do that, I don't have this huge discount, right? So it's my there is an incentive for me to freeze the assets because then I have kind of a payoff. Um, so maybe something like this, it's kind of um, yeah, interesting to, to think about it. So that's one article. I, I just saw, uh, saw it in the plane when I was flying last week to um, to Trondheim. Um, to, no, two weeks ago. Uh, and that's kind of interesting. And there is another one. Uh, whoops. Let me just let me move my mouse. So this this is a report from um, Cisco. Um, what is Cisco? They do routers. They do routers, right? They do networking equipment. They're not really into the business of consulting, uh, of driving a hype. They are just kind of a network uh, infrastructure support company. So they did a research on, on blockchain. So why do you think they are kind of interested in, in blockchain? Well, Cisco is leading several efforts to make blockchain technology Right <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, but you know, they wouldn't go into something that is just a fad or something that is just a hype. If there are, if there is a need and they can kind of supply something for that need, they will go into it. If there is no need, they wouldn't, right? So, them doing this research and them doing kind of this uh, um, announcements, those reports suggests that they themselves see kind of a demand growing and they want to position themselves as a offering in that space, uh, which is kind of an interesting development. So um, we talked before about the, um, some of the crypto systems. We didn't talk directly about the, the blockchain itself, right? So how much do you know? What is a blockchain? What do you need for the blockchain to work? And why did we came up with a blockchain concept? Well, to my understanding, a uh, blockchain is kind of a ledger composed of blocks, which yep. again uh, consists of uh, uh, public transactions, where the idea is that uh, each transaction can be verified uh, yep. as kind of uh, genuine by yeah. other pairs on the network, and that way you kind of have, uh, yeah, you, you don't 
uh, run the risk of fraud and, 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 and uh, invalid transactions. Um, yeah, sounds good. So, uh, what is Ledger? Uh, it's a list. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a list. Uh, so, usually who and what, for example, right? So, Alice has 10 and Bob has 20, right? It's a ledger. Uh, you can have timestamp into it. Uh, you can have more kind of elaborate ledgers. Um, it's just a list. So, blocks and transactions. Uh, and verification. So, yeah, so blocks have a header and transactions and, uh, inside. Um, the header has some metadata and it points out the previous block, right? And then you have a kind of, you go down all the way to the genesis block. And the genesis block is the very first block which starts the chain. And this thing is called blockchain, right? Uh, so we have a chain of blocks which kind of points back to each other, which each contains some transactions. So what is a transaction? Transfer of the lot between the two. Yeah, so in general, uh, it's a transfer of something between the in and out, right? Uh, in general, um, what we can do is we can kind of talk specifically Bitcoin as an example of a, of a um, blockchain and transaction system. And in Bitcoin, uh, the in, yeah, let, let's talk about out first. So. If you have some value that you can transfer, you will specify kind of the output point. Um, so you can have multiple outputs, and each output point uh, has a certain value associated with it. So there is a value associated with this output, and then there is a script that the new owner of this value has to use to unlock and be able to transfer it somewhere, right? So you have the uh, unlock script which allows the new owner of that value to be able to use somewhere else. And on the input, you basically point out the unlock script to some out of another transaction, which then you can spend, right? So in Bitcoin, there is no accounting, there is no kind of a value stored anywhere. The value is basically passed from one transaction to another all the time forever. Uh, and the sum of all the input value has to match the sum of all the output values minus some delta, which is the fees which the miners take. So if here I have, it sums up to 100, and here it sums up to 90, then I have 10, which is left, left over, and that 10 disappears. And the miners will take them, that missing bit, and they will pass it somewhere else uh, in the transaction, which is uh, called, uh, gen um, yeah, what, what's that called? Uh, not Genesis, it's called um, Coinbase transaction. So each block has a special transaction, which is the very first transaction, uh, and that is called, called Coinbase. And this is the minor reward transaction which the miner gets from mining that block. Um, and all the differences of all those transactions kind of uh, go in here and the miner who mined this block can pass this value plus all those fees to a new transaction output, right? So they can um, they can pass it to another transaction output. And those things are called unspent transaction output uh, because it's, it hasn't been spent yet, right? Uh, once it is spent, it's not called unspent because it's been already spent. 
right? So for example, this one, this output has been spent to this transaction, but those two are not spent yet. So they are called unspent transaction outputs, and then from the Coinbase transaction, the value of the reward and the value of all the fees can go there. What happens if there is 100 here and 100 here? There is no fee. Is it possible to do that? Yes. Yes, sure, it's possible. Uh, why the current protocol prevents that to happen? Why if you post a transaction which has zero fees, the node's not supposed to propagate it? Because then nobody would want to pay. So what? And then miners wouldn't get paid, so they wouldn't mine. Miners still get the reward. So miners get the reward from the mining the block. There is a, a Bitcoin reward, even if all the transactions are empty. Even if the block is empty and there is no transactions in the block, they still get the reward. I mean, if you have a fearless uh, system, you kind of uh, encourage uh, flooding the system with transactions. Exactly. Yeah. So to prevent denial of service attacks and flooding the system with just dummy transactions, you just send money to yourself, you know, a million times, and all the nodes will have to do their work, and all the miners will have to do their work, then the system is very inefficient, right? So, fee-less system is possible, and in, in the early days of Bitcoin, all transactions were fee-less. Uh, there were no fees attached to transactions. Uh, nowadays, it is kind of not really the case. You can try. Uh, and there are, there, I haven't checked recently, but there used to be some miners who we, which were uh, using a fee-less kind of uh, transactions to mine only fee-less transactions. Uh, but yeah, it, it is kind of a bet for denial of service types of attacks. Um, all right, so let's go through the slides. It will be a little bit easier for me to follow the uh, what I need to tell you. Um, so. You know hashing, we discussed hashing before. Uh, there are different mechanisms for hashing. You know RIPE MD is one of the uh, hashing algorithms. Uh, it uses the, the default one is 160 bits, um, which is um, 20 bytes, right? Um, uh, the avalanche property is that if you modify kind of just one bit of the input, it changes at least half of the output bits, right? Half is perfect, right? Uh, so you want kind of a small modification on the input to have a huge impact on the output. Um, we talked about distributed hash tables. Uh, what's IRC? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Uh, what is it? It's an old version of this code. Yes, yeah. it's the original messaging system of, for the internet. Is it a peer-to-peer -peer system or is it a client-server system? Client-server, I think mostly. It's kind of both, right? So the servers form a peer-to-peer -peer network because the servers need to kind of talk with each other. Uh, and there is some sort of topology because you don't want kind of a um, uh, you want some trust in the how the messages are passed around, right? Uh, but the client then talks to one of the servers to send and receive messages, right? So if you are connected to one of the IRC servers and I'm connected to some other server, they will talk to each other and they will pass the messages for the channels and for the messaging, right? So the infrastructure layer is kind of peer-to-peer. -peer. The communication between the clients and the server is just client-server. And there is like your node just connects to one of the servers, right? Um, why do we use it? What is useful about IRC in the context of peer-to-peer -peer networks? Like the name, it, it is instant relay chat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you kind of avoid uh, going through other kind of actors in the network. Yeah. Because you you're all kind of interconnected. That's right. And what? Why? Why would you use it for? What? What would you use it for? 
secure communication? Yeah, you can kind of use it for secure communication, but you can also use it for rendezvous, for meeting. So if you want, for example, uh, join, uh, you, let's say you came up with some peer-to-peer -peer system, uh, and you have a node now which wants to join the existing peer-to-peer -peer system, how the node will know where the other peers are. You have to have some sort of a mechanism to advertise of where where other nodes are, how to connect to, to the network. Uh, so you have to, you need some sort of a rendezvous place where people advertise where they are and like new people can connect, right? Um, so queuing mechanisms, first, first out, last and first out, um, and peer-to-peer uh, -peer system. So what's the biggest difference between Gnutella and BitTorrent? What they do you know them? Do you know both of those systems? I know BitTorrent. Yeah. Yeah, the other one is kind of not really used anymore. Um, it's a, a bit obsolete, but it was a precursor for BitTorrent. So uh, people need uh, to share files, and sharing files is kind of um, um, one of the kind of uh, killing apps for peer-to-peer -peer systems, right? So if you have uh, if you have a peer-to-peer -peer system which is used for file sharing. Um, so you have three sources, they all have file A, right? And now I am here and I want to get file A. Um, so I start downloading it from the source A, uh, from, from the source one. And then I get, you know, 50% done, and then this node disappears, right? So then what happens? I have to continue downloading it from somewhere else. And I have to make sure that this file is exactly the same as this one, and then I start downloading it from the exact location of where I stopped, right? So Nutella was kind of a mechanism uh, initially, where people could advertise what they have, it would check the content, the hashing of all the files, it would make an index, it would kind of make, make, make a directory, and then if you need a file, you would talk to it and you would say, I need file A, and it would tell you, well, you can get it from this or that source, right? And then you kind of start downloading it, if this node goes down, you kind of say, ah, oh, I got to 50%, I need the, the rest. And it would say, yeah, continue from this source, right? So it was kind of a centralized peer-to-peer -peer system which allowed you to download large files, um, but, and kind of be robust for the node failures, right? So if the node goes down, you can still download it if some other uh, sources exist in the network, right? It had two problems. So one problem was uh, the downloads were kind of done um, from a single source at the time, right? So at a given time, you were downloading it just from one source. Um, that was first problem. What was the second problem? The second problem is that that represents a single point of failure. So if someone targets that system, then you can't do anything else, right? If you shut down a Nutella server, nobody can say, I have this file, and nobody can say, can I get this file, right? So it, it is kind of a centralized at that point, right? Okay, so to address those two problems, we came up with BitTorrent. Um, so the BitTorrent was the answer to those two points. The first thing was, um, it's like Git. What you can do is, you can cut the files into chunks, right? You can cut each file into chunks, um, and then you have a listing of where those chunks are, and if a particular chunk is exactly the same as somebody else's chunk, you don't care if it's the same file or if it's different file, if it has exactly the same hash, if it's the same bits, right? for that chunk, 
you can transfer it to somebody, right? Um, so now what happens is um, what you say is you say I want a particular file which consists of a number of chunks and then the system will give you an index which tells, which tells you of where you can get those chunks from and you can start downloading them concurrently from different sources. Right? So you have a parallel uh, download because depending on how many chunks your particular file has, you can download from multiple sources. And those indexes are just like files or data structures that can be passed around. Right? So you can generate kind of an initial index for the chunks that you have locally on, of, of your file. Uh, and then you can publicize it using the kind of a peer-to-peer -peer system and others can compare what chunks they have and they can re-advertise some of the uh, chunks that you have and this way you can kind of have hierarchical structure for where things are and those, those things are advertised or they can be kind of a shared uh, from multiple servers, right? So then the question is, how would you find them? Well, you have to, you need some sort of a search engine, right? Uh, you need to have some sort of search engine for those files to be able to kind of find them and be able to use them. Uh, but there is no single point of failure. Uh, you can have multiple search engines, you can have multiple sources for those files, you can share them on messaging boards, you can share them on IRC and so on, right? Um, so now we kind of address this. We can concurrently download the same content, I mean, chunked content from different sources, and we don't have the single point of failure. All right, so we have the basic building blocks, uh, private public key cryptography we've, we've covered before. Um, what's, um, what's money, we don't need to discuss that much. Um, so, we kind of jump into Bitcoin, which we started with. Um, so it has been developed most likely by a group of people uh, who use the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. Um, there are some speculations of who that person or the group is. It's kind of unknown until now. Um, it is a, a decentralized peer-to-peer self-regulating -reg system. Um, it is a form of uh, cryptocurrency. Uh, it has some drawbacks that, that um, you've already discussed briefly. Um, and it has some properties uh, such that there will be a, a fixed amount which is mined globally. Um, the units are divide, dividable <laughs> by eight decimal places. So you can have quite a large amount of um, information stored in a single coin. Um, you can, uh, so the first transaction in the blog is special. It has this kind of award. A uh, and we've already discussed this, that it's, it's called a coin-based coin transaction. Um, and we can kind of jump we can jump into the block explorer and kind of see how kind of an example transactions look like. Uh, so we can go to a particular block. So if I go to some early blocks, like 45,000. Yeah, That's fine. So I go Oh, come on. <laughs> no so we are using Bitcoin. So we are at the block number 45,900, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then you can see there is only one transaction right, in that early block. So the miner generated a block with no other transaction but the reward transaction. And the reward transaction at the time, which was uh, 19th of March 2010, was 50 Bitcoins, right? 
how much is currently a reward for mining a block? Less well, than that. Point Less than that? How much? Yeah? I think it's 12.5. 12.5. Exactly. And that's because um, whoever designed the system wanted to spread the Bitcoins to the general population and they wanted to have kind of a, a nice curve. So the early adopters get more reward and then the later you get in, the smaller the reward is. Uh, and the reward, um, roughly speaking, halves every four years. So every four years the reward is half, halved. So initially it was 50 bitcoins, then it went to 25, now it's uh, 12 and a half. The next halving event will happen approximately uh, in May next year, uh, 2020. Um, the blocks are generated every 10 minutes on average, right? So on average the, the puzzle, the cryptographic puzzle that is used to generate the block allows whoever is first to find it in about 10 minutes time. If the blocks are being mined faster, that means the difficulty has to increase. If the blocks are uh, mined too slow, the, that means the difficulty has to go down, right? What is the difficulty? Well, the difficulty is each block has to be hashed. Um, so you have the header, you have the transactions, and you have one, so those things are fixed. This is fixed, this is fixed. You cannot really manipulate it. Uh, so if you hash it, you will always get the same result, right? You will get kind of the result for hashing, right? Uh, but there is one field which is called nouns, uh, which you can manipulate. And based on what you put in here, the hash will change. So the hash of the block will be different depending on what you put here. So it will kind of depend on these nouns, right? And by playing with these nouns, you can generate different hashes. So the difficulty is, if you have the hash, uh, you have to find the hash in bits that have a certain number of zeros up front, right? So the more zeros you require up front, the harder it is to find such a hash, uh, because there is less of, of po possible answers. Um, so initially the difficulty was quite low, uh, you could kind of uh, generate the hashes quite fast and as we get the difficulty higher, you are required to find more and more zeros up front for the hash to be valid, right? Um, so that's how, how we deal with the difficulty, uh, that's how we deal with the rewards, so the first transaction for the block um, goes to the miner. Uh, why do we have, um, so let's see here, uh, yeah, so ho solving the hash puzzle, um, we roughly use 10 minutes uh, for generating a block, um, every 2016 blocks the system adjusts difficulty automatically, right, so it checks how many blocks were discovered, if they uh, 2016 blocks took much longer than expected, the difficulty goes lower. If it took much faster than expected, the difficulty rises, right, by one bit, right? Uh, so it kind of adjusts to the... Um, and then, uh, every, roughly speaking, about four years, we halve the reward. Uh, so the last halving was July 2016, right, two, two years ago. Each block references the hash from the previous one, and then uh, the longest chain is used by all the peers, and then the, sh the shorter ones are orphaned. Uh, and the length is measured by the length from the genesis block, plus the difficulty used in the blocks. Why is that? Why do we include the difficulty in the calculation of how long the chain is? Because someone might want to try and uh, make a longer chain with easier difficulty. Exactly. So you could theoretically change the difficulty mine very long chain and advertise the longest one uh, because you are using lower difficulty than the, the, the current one, right? Um, so based on the difficulty, you always prefer the harder problems than the easier, easier ones, right? 
uh, the nodes don't keep track of when the difficulty is adjusted and, and so on, right? Because it's kind of dynamic. So if you are a node and you are given a kind of an information about the, the state of the blockchain, you basically check which one is the hardest, right? So even if the current difficulty is set at certain level, but you try to mine harder blocks and you do it better than the existing system, your blocks would be kind of uh, awarded, right? Yeah, so it's kind of dynamic, but it's self-adjusting system. Um, so you have nodes, um, and they talk with each other, and then some of the nodes mine, they mine uh, the new, new blocks, and they advertise a new block into the network, right? So each node sees a particular history from the genesis block to the current top level block. And if you advertise a new block, you say, I found this block, and you kind of advertise it to a network, the nodes will check, oh, do you reference the, node, the, the top of the chain that I think is the top of the chain? If you don't, then I discard you, right? I don't consider what you're saying. Um, if they do, then let's say this, this node thinks this is the top, this node advertises this new block, this node says yes, uh, it's fine, it verifies that the hashes co are correct, that the back hash is correct, that everything is fine, and then it changes his pointer to say, yeah, now I believe this is the top of the, of the blockchain, right? Does that mean that a bunch of blocks are getting dropped, or are that what you said? Uh, they become kind of orphans, so they're still part of the chain? They're not part of the chain. Okay. So an orphan means, yeah, okay, so uh, so let's, let's look at it. So what happens is um, you have the genesis block, you have blocks. And now we have those two blocks, which are kind of the top of the chain. Uh, and then we have two miners, which advertise two conflicting blocks. They found block roughly at the same time and they advertise it to a network. So one advertise this block, one advertise this block, right? Um, so you have, let's say, A and B. And this one was the, or, you know, the one which everybody agrees, right? So now when they advertise it, some, some nodes will become A nodes, some will become B nodes, right? So what will happen is, uh, Let's say uh, we have a situation like this. So let's say this is the B node, this is the A, right? So now this node believes this is the top of the chain. This node believes this is the top of the chain, right? Um, and that's the current, current situation. What happens next is the next block needs to be mined, right? So the, the miner who discovered the B block obviously is mining a new block rooted in, in its block, in, in, in its root, right? And then everybody else who said, okay, uh, let's say these guys are mining, but they are mining from the A, right? So now there is kind of again a race, right? Who is first, right? And one of them will be first, right? Um, so let's say uh, A block is first. So they have A2, right? So now they advertise to everybody A2. Um, and A2, so let's say this one was length, yeah, let's do a very short one. So this is length 0, 1, 2, 3, right? So now it advertises we have the third block uh, and it's A2, right? It advertises to this guy and it says, sure, uh, I will swap easily to point to this one uh, and to these two guys. And these two guys think it's B, right? So they think this is the top of the chain, but they get information that this one is now the top of the chain. The length uh, is three, and the difficulty is this combined difficulty, right? They have alternative to keep believing this, but the length is two, and the difficulty is the difficulty is less than this one, or update, right? So the normal nodes will update, right? So if you advertise it to normal nodes, 
they will say, yeah, you, uh, what I believe is obsolete, I will switch to a two now, right? Um, so all these nodes are kind of switching to a two, right? What will the miner do? So the miners, which control some of the nodes, they control them. They can force them to do what they say. They don't have to follow the protocol, right? Um, the miners will have to decide how likely it is for them to outperform this um, <laughs> this chain, right? So, what would you do? Uh, would you switch? Would you like? Let's say you, you're still mining this. You haven't, you haven't found this block yet. You got an advertisement that somebody found this, this block and you know they already started mining the next one, right? Uh, what would you do? You could probably drop it and switch. So you would probably stop mining what you were mining and switch to mining this one as quickly as you can, right? But if you got this advertisement and you already found this block as well, right? You already have this block and you already are at the level three. You can kind of uh, take a risk and continue mining your, your things, right? Because if you discard this one, you're losing the reward which is here, the reward which is here, right? Uh, you vested kind of, uh, you know, power and, and work into those two rewards and you're kind of competing who's gonna win, right? You may take a chance that if you kind of have your computing power, uh, you know, enough and, and, and you're lucky enough, you might find the fourth one before this chain and then you can kind of swap it, right? So if the difference is just one block, you can take a chance. If the difference is two blocks, your chance of being able to outperform it kind of goes down rapidly, right? Uh, so it's a bit of a game. But eventually what happens is one of those chains loses, right? So one of these chains, let's say B, uh, and then we have A3 here, and this becomes the blockchain, right? So if you actually browsing the blockchain, that's what you see. You don't see all those orphans, right? All the orphans happened, but they just never became really proper blocks in the blockchain, right? Um, you can uh, check them, you can see how it historically happened, uh, but they are not technically part of the blockchain. So all the orphans are kind of dropped. So all the transactions in the orphans are not part of the ledger. They are not part of the transactions that happened. Um, okay, so um, we have the, the block header. We have some uh, metadata. So, you know, a version of the protocol, the previous hash, the Merkle, Merkle uh, tree root of the transactions. Um, what, what's Merkle tree? We covered that before. Isn't it just kind of a, a tree of hashes? But I don't kind of remember that yes. one hash at the end. Or tree of hashes. Right. Um, so what that, what does it mean is that at the root you have hash of hashes and all the way down to hashes. Right. So let's say we have four things: uh, A, B, C, and D, and those are the hashes of those A, B, C, and D, and then the intermediary are the hashes of those pairs. And then you have the hash of the of the rest, right? Um, so, if why why do you use this instead of um, just taking A, B, C, and D uh, and hashing the whole thing? And there is just a single hash. So if, if you need to verify the, those four things, why don't you just calculate a single hash and then have the 
um, the comparison of what you hashed it to to what it should be and see if it actually is correct. If not, because what happens is if I manipulated something in D and I have D1, then the hash wouldn't work, right? Correct? So if, if this hash was uh, calculated for A, B, C, and D, and this, and then somewhere someone manipulated one of the transactions, then if I'm comparing this hash with this hash, they shouldn't match. So I will detect that there is something wrong, right? Correct? So for n things to verify, um, I can use one one operation to verify that it's correct, and how many instructions do I need to do to verify that that particular one is incorrect? So if those have their own hashes, right? They have their own hashes. Then I have to do n operations to, well, n on average half, right? But we kind of say uh, in O notation it would be n, right? Uh, so on average I have to do n half checks to see which one is actually incorrect, right? So with this data structure, it's more efficient to find out which one is incorrect because I have those hashes here uh, and I have the partial hashes kind of up the chain so I'm kind of I can uh, do like half already after the first operation and then comparison of the of those two right so I can if this if one of those doesn't match then I already know it's one of those so I, I kind of do less operation it's like lock uh, so we're using Merkle trees to kind of be a little bit more efficient in uh, for checking things and we can also reuse it right uh, if I have a subset of transactions um, so let's say I'm mining um, um, so mempool uh, is all the transactions that people advertise into a network to be included into blocks right and I have a lot of transactions here um, and then I, I'm creating my my uh, block and I'm taking um, you know n transactions uh, but then I have to drop this block because some of, some of the transactions have been included already. So part of my tree is kind of uh, gone, but part I can reuse. So I can reuse some of the data structures uh, while I'm processing the transactions as well. Um, okay, so what is uh, that? Directed the cyclic graph. What does it mean? It means it's a graph which doesn't have cycles and it has arrows. So it has nodes and stuff goes from one node to another node. It goes from one node to another node and it cannot, it, it is directed, so I can go back, but um, you cannot have cycles, right? So if you cannot have cycles, that would be kind of illegal. So you have to say it is kind of like this. So you unwrap it and it always kind of goes forward, right? Um, and we use it for transactions so transaction cannot be spent twice right so when we had those transactions uh, transaction transaction we have those outputs inputs let's say this transaction has uh, one input uh, two inputs because you always have a con base so two inputs one output if I already spend it to this transaction I cannot spend it again so I have the 
arc to input. I have the arc from the output, but then from here I cannot have it again, right? Uh, so transactions form a directed uh, a cyclic graph. Um, this idea has been used also to say if all the transactions really form an, a, a cyclic directed graph, right? Because that's what happens. Like if you unroll all those blocks, all those blocks with the transactions, right? All those transactions in the blocks, if you just unroll them into this big giant DAG, right? Uh, why don't you represent the blockchain as this transaction graph directly instead of putting them into blocks, right? So you have this concept of blockchains which have transactions which link um, other transactions and they form a cyclic directed graph, right? Um, we will not talk about it today, but the, the concept of the DAG blockchain is kind of already used in a, in a Bitcoin in a sense, because the tr all the transactions are forming a DAG. It's just that you organize it into kind of a snapshots. So you have the generations, you have, you know that before that time, that what happened, and after that time, that's what happened. If you represent things as a, as a DAG, it's a little bit difficult to have kind of a, a total order of all the transactions that happened, right? You have partial orders, like partial pathways, but you don't have a total order guaranteed. Um, so there are some uh, problems and some properties which uh, DAG representation has and some which kind of a chain representation has. All right, so we can have a look at the transaction, this particular one. So you have um, so you have um, four four point three 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 nine coming in from a particular output of the previous transaction. So that's the one input into this transaction. And then you have two values, which go to this um, address and to this address. Um, one spends almost one Bitcoin and one spends uh, 33. And then if you sum this together, minus this, you will notice that there is 0 0.008 missing. So that becomes the fee, right? Um, This transaction is not a coin-based transaction, it's a normal transaction, which will be included in the block, right? Uh, you can look at the block. So if I go to the block, um, you will see that this block has, um, uh, yeah, this block explorer doesn't, gives me the, the number of in inputs and outputs. But in total, it, it kind of, uh, the volume of this block is uh, over 3,000 Bitcoins, right? Uh, included in the, um, and then it will have, um, it will have a Coinbase transaction, which is the block reward. So we can, Find it and it will be. It was at the top. Yeah, this one. Yeah, that's right. So this is a Coinbase transaction. Uh, so you will see the. Yeah, we can have a look. So the reward. So this transaction actually spends, uh, uh, not spends, it kind of uh, gets on the input. 13.17 blah, 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 right? Uh, 13,000. Uh, so how come? Uh, how come you have uh, such a large number kind of coming in? Well, because that's an address, it's not a transaction. So that's the, yeah, let's go back. Uh, 
So you have a concept of an address and you have a concept of a transaction, right? Um, so one more into the block. Yeah, so I clicked on this one, and this is actually an address, not a transaction. This is the transaction, right? So this is a transaction, and those are the output, the input addresses, and th this are the output addresses of this transaction, right? So to view that transaction, I have to go to the transaction itself, and then I see that the transaction is 1486 uh, bitcoins, so, and then there is nothing else, right? So what does it mean? It means that there was a 12.5 reward plus 2.36 uh, worth of fees in the, in the block, right? What if the miner set here 12.5 and ignored the fees? What would happen? The coins would be gone. The coins would be gone. Nothing happened, the coins are just disappeared, right? So they are actually removed from the system. So the total 21 million is now less than the, the 21 million because those coins are gone forever, right? What if the miner said, there oh, are 15 bitcoins, I, I just rounded up to 15 bitcoins. <laughs> what would happen then? Then the... Yeah, the, exactly. So the block would be invalid because the sums don't match up, right? It has to be, uh, so they, they, in, the, in the rules, they say uh, the Coinbase transaction uh, value has to be less or equal the reward plus the sum of all the deltas, right? All the fees, right? It, it can be zero, like the miner can say, I don't want the reward and I don't want anything. It, it's just zero, right? So all those coins are gone, right? Uh, but it cannot be more. It cannot be more than. It can be equal to that, all the fees, right? Yeah, why do they allow you to not like, if there were a reward? Would that compromise, like, they have a set number yeah, that's right. So that means it would be less, right? If the miners don't take the reward, that would be less, right? I mean, they don't enforce it because they um, want the incentive systems to work alongside the rules. So the, the rules are kind of a little bit more flexible and the incentive systems kind of strengthens the system, right? Uh, so why would miners not take the reward? They should take the reward, right? Therefore, it's not in the rules, right? The rules are to prevent abuse. The rules are not to, pre to force that kind of normal behavior. So the normal behavior should just normally happen. Um, and if the miners don't take the, the money, it's not really an abuse. Like, uh, yeah. Cool, you just burned a lot of energy to get the lock and you didn't want the money. That's right. So that's a bit weird, right? Okay, so... Um, what else can we do? Um, so we could talk a little bit about the script. Um, so we have, um, whoops, not this one, this one. We have this output and input scripts. Um, I will, um, yeah, I will show you first before we do that. I will show you this. So this is how the address is generated, right? So a Bitcoin address is basically a hash of the public part of the public-private key pair. So to participate in Bitcoin, you generate yourself a public-private key pair. Uh, you keep the private part really private. You should not you know, show it to anybody or lose it. Uh, you, you should make backups, but the backups has to have to be, you know, uh, not exposed. There was a TV show uh, early on, uh, and one of the one of the inter um, interviewers, no interview, the person who was interviewed, uh, he said that he backs up his uh, private keys uh, by printing a QR code, and he showed 
<laughs> the QR code on the TV, right? And very quickly, somebody like us scanned the, the QR code to get his private key and stole him like two and half bitcoins, right? Um, so then he said, yeah, that's kind of okay. Like I, I made a mistake, you know, uh, fair enough. <laughs> I lost, you know, 2.5 bitcoins. Uh, so if, if you back it up in a kind of a printed version or whatever, you still have to kind of uh, keep it safe and secure, right? And then what we do is we take this um, um, public part of the key uh, from the elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, we prepend the version number of the protocol, which is version one. And that's why all the addresses are, you know, start with one. Um, and then what we do, we take this, uh, the whole thing, uh, and we hash it with SHA-256 and then with write MD, right? Um, this kind of generates us the 20 bytes which we have uh, again we prepended with one with the network ID uh, and we hash twice the 20 bytes with SHA-256 and we only use the first four bytes of that hash as a checksum so we then have the original 20 bytes from this first hashing and then we use the final four bytes for the final hashing. So then you can use those four bytes to verify that those 20 bytes are correct. So those 20 bytes and those four bytes have to match up. If they don't match up, there is an error somewhere. There is a, a typing type, typo or something went wrong. It's not the proper address, right? Um, and then once we have it, we use base 58. Do you know base 58 encoding? Yeah, so you have base 64, you know this one, right? What we typically use base 64 for? So if you have a binary data and you need to send it in an email, and email only deals with text, you cannot send binary data through SMTP. You can only send text because that's how the protocol works or you have a messaging system, or you have a URL, and you want to uh, you know, put uh, like a binary key into a URL. You cannot just do it because binary has, uh, you know, it's, it's not easily re represented in a textual format. So you encode it using base64 into a representation, which is a text, which has uh, 64 characters to represent binary data, right? So base 58 means we lost some characters. And as you said, we kind of losing all the characters which are too confusing for humans. So like capital O and zero are confusing. One and L are confusing. Um, what else is confusing? Um, there, are, there are some characters which are kind of the same. So base 58 removes the... <laughs> The confusing part. So it allows only zero, no capital O. It allows only one, no smaller L letter, and so on. There is a, like, um, you know, six of those characters which are removed from the set. And then the rest is uh, the same as base 64. So then we have the address, and uh, it doesn't use some of the characters which potentially are confusing for spelling, for typing. So the address is effectively a hash, right? So when we talk about um, script, uh, we need some sort of language to express uh, the unlocking and locking of the transactions. So on the input, uh, we have some script. And on the output, we have some script. And then the script is using stack. It's using kind of a fourth like, you know, fourth? Um, that programming language. Um, so it, it looks kind of a little bit like this. Uh, 10, 20, n. Right? So you put arguments first, they end up on the stack, and then you do the operation. And the operation takes parameters from the stack and puts the result onto the stack. So it's, uh, in this case, it would put 10 on top of the stack, then it would put 20, and then it would add. So if this is the top of the stack, it would add the 
two top elements, so it will take them out and put 30 on top, right? So if I want to write a more complex program, what I could do is I could put a uh, 10, a uh, loop, loop, and then multiply and add. What this program would do? Well, it would put 10 on the stack, duplicate, duplicate it, duplicate the top element again, and then multiply. So it would take the first top two elements, it would multiply, multiply them, so it would put 100 on top, and then the final instruction is add. So it would, again, take two items from the stack and put the result on top, right? So it is kind of a simple language for doing programming. You can do arbitrary programming with, with uh, fourth, and you can, uh, you can uh, declare uh, methods which are sequences of those steps, right? Um, it is kind of awkward because you always have parameters in the front, and you have what happens next based on the stack. So you have to like uh, twist your head a little bit of how it actually works, right? Because normally what we would do, we would say 10 plus, no, 10 multiplied by 10 plus 10, right? So we kind of uh, see what happens and then what happens next. Whereas here, you kind of, uh, you know, it's a little bit awkward to, to do that. So usually what happens is fourth forces you to have very short statements. Uh, so the statements in fourth are kind of very short because you have to deal with the state. Uh, so you declare uh, a number of uh, function calls, which are kind of a short instructions, and then you kind of work with it. Um, so anyway, here what we want is we want kind of a script like that, which when executed will end up with a true on the top of the stack. If that's true, then you can you spend your, your coins, right? If it's not, it's not, right? So for if, you know, uh, roughly speaking, if the address of the, uh, of the owner of the coins is a hash, right? So roughly speaking, it's a hash of the address of the public, of public key, right? Um, what we can do is we can say, um, I will put, uh, I will put um, a signature, um, no, I will put a, a public key. So I will put this address into the script and then I will call um, check check signature. So if I, if I put a public key here and I require the owner of the public key to sign, the, sign this transaction with the private key and put the signature here, then I can verify if this matches this and then I can unlock the output. Does it make sense? So let's say I have one Bitcoin lock here, and I'm saying the script is this, right? So there is a, a data which I'm putting on top of the stack, and I'm calling a check signature, and then what the whoever wants to unlock it needs to supply is the actual signature. So it's the input to the script, which comes in here, and then I will execute this instruction. And that instruction compares if this signature was generated with a private key of this public key to sign the, this transaction, right? The side effect, so th this is a mechanism which was used originally. So if we go to the, uh, oops, if we go to the, uh, some of the, uh, this one was the block height. Um, it only has one transaction. Um, it only has a uh, Coinbase transaction. 
and you see the the difficulty of the of the hashes of the of the blocks. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't show me with this one. It doesn't show me what the Coinbase transaction is. So let's go. Um, the example that you had in the PowerPoint was a different block. Yeah, but it was a later block. So. Uh, yeah. Let's see if we can if we can find it. You're missing a line on the start. Which one I missed? Uh, nine. Thanks. We found it. We found the Coinbase transaction. So there are no inputs, and we're getting 50 bitcoins, right? And we can uh, look at this transaction script. Uh, <laughs> and this transaction script looks exactly what I just said, right? It says push data, which is the uh, public key of somebody. And then it says check signature. So whoever wants to claim those coins has to supply a signature which matches this private key, right? So what will happen if we and uh, if if we crack the generation of the private key based on the public key? I now know whose public key. I mean, I I have the public key. If I can brute force a search to find a private key, I can steal those fifty coins, right? Uh, because this is unspent um, amount. So this mechanism is called pay to public key. And that was the very first mechanism used in Bitcoin to pay to, um, to people, right? But it has the disadvantage that the public key is visible here. And if I can brute force something, I can eventually steal those coins, right? So that's what would you use to kind of make it harder or impossible to do? What you can do is you can modify the script a little bit and, and do something like this. You can say, um, please uh, put your signature here. <coughs> uh, please put the hash of the, uh, your public key in here. And then what I will do is I will um, uh, I will duplicate the hash, and then I will I have so oops I will put the hash in here. Um, I will um, yeah you have to duplicate this right so you kind of. Uh, duplicate that hash and then you will do the check sick so you will kind of a check signature and then you will compare uh, the hash with this hash that it's actually the same hash right uh, so what I'm asking is instead of using the public key uh, you can use the hash of the public key I will compare it to the hash I put into the transaction and I will also verify that this um, signature, uh, no, yeah, in fact, you cannot do that. You have, because to verify the signature, I, I need your public key. So you have to put public key in, and then what I will do is I will duplicate uh, the public key, I will hash it, uh, I will check the signature, and I will check, uh, check verify to check if this public key hashes to the hash that I had in the transaction, right? So it's a little bit more complex uh, because I'm putting into the output, I'm putting only the hash of the transaction. To unlock it, you have to put your public key. So once you've spent those coins, your public key is now visible in the blockchain. So you should never use that public key again. For every transaction you're making, you should always make a new public-private key pair and spend it right and, and use it uh, so if we go to uh, this transaction that we have later on 
Um, so we have some later transaction and we check the output script. Now it looks what I just said, right? Um, it duplicates the public key. So it expects signature and a public key as an input to the script. And then it duplicates the, um, the public key. It hashes it. And then it checks, it checks if this hash, which I put in here, matches the public key hash that I have, and then it checks the signature between the signature and the public key. So it first checks the hashes. I, I kind of wrote it the, the other way around, right? Uh, to check first the signature, then to check the hash. But it first checks the hash. If it doesn't match, then it stops. But if it matches, then it checks the signature, right? Um, what if you don't put uh, any script in, in the output? What if you create a transaction which has uh, no script in the output? It can't be verified. Well, it's valid. Like it's you know. <coughs> so no script doesn't leave true on the stack. If script doesn't leave true on the stack, it's a, it's false. It's a non-valid script. So it will not be able. Nobody will be able to spend it. What if I have a script which says true, put true on the stack? And anybody can spend it. Anybody can make a transaction which spans that script, right? So if you browse the blockchain and find a transaction which has a script which in itself validates to true, you can spend it, right? Um, and if there is a transaction which validates to false, then nobody can spend it neither, right? Uh, so if you have an output which uh, 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 with the script which evaluates to false, then nobody can spend it either. There is an instruction called op return, um, and then you have like uh, 31 bytes that you can put on in here. Nobody can spend this because op return puts false on the stack, and that's it. Right? It finishes. Um, it fails the script. Um, it is used to store some data with the uh, with the blockchain. So this is uh, the final thing I will show you today because we run out of time. Um, so if we go, um, uh, we discussed that already. Yeah. So if we go. Let me check this. There is a transaction which has two inputs and three outputs. Um, two of them are spendable, but the first one is unspent. The second one, the, the third one is spent. Um, the middle one, this one, it says I cannot, um, I cannot decode the address. It's something weird, right? Uh, I don't know what it is. Um, so then you can check those output scripts. So the output scripts, there are three of them, one, two, three, right? So the first one is, yeah, so that, that, that one is called pay to public key hash. Uh, so this one, the first one, and the last one are pay to public key hash. It's basically somebody's pub public key hash here and here, and the check is done. The middle one is op return, right? The op return is putting some data, which looks like this, uh, and that's it. Th this cannot be spent, but you know, no worries because it's zero bitcoins, <laughs> right? Um, so what is this? Um, well, if you look at this, you see that there is an address, Bitcoin address, which is also used as an output. So somebody sent money to itself, right? To herself or himself. So the money goes all the way to herself or itself plus some small change, small dust, like 0 
five, whatever, right? So whoever did that potentially rounded up to um, some decimal places or something, and then there was some dust left over. And then zero goes to here, and that much goes as fees, right? Uh, to the miner. Uh, so if you look at this, you forensically you would say money didn't change hands because whoever sent the money sent it to itself, right? So no money changed hands. But if you look at it kind of uh, more closely and you analyze this kind of uh, embedded transaction that actually happened and you use a more um, elaborate block explorer, you will notice that um, there were almost $30,000 being spent between two people who used the Bitcoin blockchain as a mechanism to validate the transaction. Uh, and they used a coin which is called Tether US, which is a coin which maps one to one to US dollars. Uh, and they used the Bitcoin blockchain to facilitate this transaction. So in fact, $29,000 changed hands, even though in the Bitcoin blockchain you see nothing that really happened, right? Um, so you can build systems on top of normal Bitcoin blockchain uh, to have more elaborate schemes uh, for um, managing transactions and for passing value. Um, so I have to stop here. Um, we will discuss uh, the reviews and the essays for next week. Next week, uh, the deadline is just before Tuesday, so um, we will do that. But I may need to go to Oslo uh, for the meeting with the police, so I will advertise on Discord if we have a class or not. Right? Um, the deadline was when was the deadline for the submission? Nine. Yeah. Both for the reviews and essays, or just the essays? Uh, just just the essays. Nine, I think that we later. Yeah. I, I see. All right, so, so in that case, next week I will tell you whether we have a lecture or not, and the reviews of the essays and reviews happens the following week, right? Because yeah. that, that's the deadline for the reviews to be in. Um, yeah. yeah. It's right before it's yeah. Eastern like this. Like on Thursday that week. Yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think Tuesday we still have a class. So that Tuesday class before Easter, we will spend reviewing the second round of uh, of essays. Easter um, is April twenty first. Yeah. Very All right. So that's it.